Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Barry Brendan, a pastor of Adult Ministries here. It's really good to be with you today, and uh, I'll be out on the wel uh, welcome uh, wall if you want to say hi, especially welcome to you who are maybe worshiping with us for the first or, or second time today. Well, uh, I can remember a day, it was just as clear as this if it were yesterday, um, it was on a Saturday morning in Jerusalem. Uh, I looked out on the streets below our ninth floor hotel room, and um, the streets were empty. I mean, the sidewalks, there wasn't anybody walking. Uh, on the sidewalks, you, you see our hotel was located in the Orthodox section in Jerusalem. And on the Sabbath, they call it Shabbat there, on the Shabbat was strictly observed. I know mean, work, uh, even walking was restricted. Uh, right down to the elevators, if you can believe it. In our hotel, for instance, there were two sets of elevators. There was one labeled the guest elevator, and it worked just like any elevator t today here. You push the button, you go in, you push whatever floor you want, and it takes you up the floor and doors open. But next to the guest elevator was another elevator. It was called the Shabbat, it was labeled Shabbat Elevator. And it worked a little differently because this one was programmed to open the door at every floor automatically. That way, an Orthodox Jew could get in and go up to his floor without making the effort to take the work to push the button on his floor. <clears throat> I know, because I accidentally took that elevator. <laughs> and it's an exercise in patience, believe me. <laughs> but the wheels of my imagination began to turn. You know, I thought, <laughs> what, if, uh, what if an Orthodox Jew accidentally got into the guest elevator? <laughs> and what, what if the doors closed and he, they were the only one in there? I mean, how would they get out? Now, I know, there's some realists out there, and you think the doors are going to open automatically eventually anyway, but for the moment, just for the moment, I wonder, would they have maybe felt trapped? You know, like there really wasn't any way out without violating their code. Well, rewind the clock now, 2,000 years to Pentecost, devout Jews had come from all over the then known world and uh, converged on Jerusalem for the Passover. You'll see here, we read in Acts 2, there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Mesopotamians, of course, Judeans. There were visitors from Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Cyrene, um, and uh, there were Cretans and Arabs and Romans all converged on Jerusalem. And they didn't have any Shabbat elevators, of course, to worry about. But they had 613 other laws that they had to observe. You know, today, I guess that's 614, you know, if you throw in the elevator rule. <laughs> but, but knowing that if you broke one, it was like breaking the whole law. Now... What, who could possibly live up to that? I mean, you were required to live a righteous life, but couldn't. It was the same feeling, like there just, there's, there's no way out. Uh, they were trapped. And that same sinking feeling sweeps over you, only not, not just for a moment. But think, it's, it's for a whole lifetime. There's got to be a better way. What if, after arriving at your hotel, maybe back then, in Jerusalem, you wake up and you look out over Jerusalem, over toward the temple, and instead of your lungs filling up with fresh morning air, you are caught with the stench of burning flesh of animals being sacrificed day after day. You go to the temple daily, and there you see blood being sprinkled, 
And you think there has got to be a better way. There's no way out. And that same sinking feeling just sweeps over you again and again. There's got to be a way out of the shame and the disappointment, the heartache, the powerlessness and defeat. There must be a way out of constantly trying to measure up and realizing you failed. Wondering and hoping and feeling that, you know, what you might do would be good enough. And for those that thought they were good enough, maybe deceived into thinking they were good enough, they were trapped too, weren't they? In their attitudes of superiority and pride. If there was ever a way out, would you take it? Well, and then you go down to the town square and you hear Peter's message. And through Peter, you hear a message of freedom and hope. You hear that the Messiah had come, and his name is Jesus. He was crucified, but God raised him up on the third day in a fulfillment of the scripture that said his Holy One would not see decay. And we talked about that last, uh, last Sunday. You hear the words of your prophet, Joel, one, a, a prophet you're familiar with, who said that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you might not even be aware that you are part of the answered prayer of Jesus. Remember when Jesus prayed in John 17? He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word, through Peter's word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. This was the first sermon preached here at Highlands Community Church over 70 years ago. It was from John 17. Well, that prayer was answered even then. As over 3,000 people heard it, the words of Peter says that their hearts were pierced And collectively, with one mouth, they said, what must we do? And Peter said, repent. Be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, that your sins may be wiped out, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with one heart and one mind, the the people all called out and accepted Christ. And that day, it says, about 3,000 people were added to their number. Just a few days later, actually, Peter preaches the same sermon, and this is what he says. He says, repent and turn back, that your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Refreshing. I can imagine what that must have meant to them. Sins blotted out? Too good to be true. There is a way out, they were, they were told. And our Messiah has come to set us free. It's the way of the cross through faith in Christ Jesus, their Messiah. And that day, the church of Jesus Christ was born. Last week, I hope you were here, we baptized four people. Wasn't that wonderful? You know, it was, it was awesome. It was powerful. And, and for those of you who um, have yet to be baptized and follow the commandment of Jesus to be baptized... Uh, we just encourage you, see me after the service. We would like to, we would like to be a part of that. But um, in the blink of an eye, 3,000 devout Jews became Messianic Jews. They, had, they received the indwelling Holy Spirit, and now there was no condemnation. They were in Christ Jesus. And being now in Christ, they were a new creation. Their sins were gone. They had eternal life. They were adopted into God's family and they'd never be separated from him. Now they could take the guest elevator. (laughs) Well, word got out. I can imagine 3,000 baptisms must have gathered some attention, don't you think? They shared what happened in their native language. So when Peter preached just a few days later, 5,000 people came and that was just men, not including women and children. So, so I be, we begin to ask, you know, what does this spiritual birth look like? 
When they're given freedom like that, it was, what was it? Freedom to do what? They could do anything. But what did the Holy Spirit prompt them to do? And that leads us to our section today in verses 42 through 47. When God shows up in a person's life, things change. <laughs> there was joy and awe among them. There was sincerity. There was this honesty, this, this freedom, all in this wonderful balance. First, of course, they put Jesus Christ as the center of their life. Galatians 2.20, many of you know this. I'm, I'm, this is not new teaching, but I call this to your minds by way of remembrance. It says this, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We'll read here that they were devoted. In fact, the word appears more than once in this short section. The word here, a devoted, it means to persist obstinately. <laughs> I kind of like that. Persistent, obstinate devotion. That's what, that's what they had. At Highlands, what are we persistently, obstinately devoted to? Hmm? To the point where nothing else matters. Whatever happens, we're going to find a way to do this, whatever it is, right? Right? We're gonna make a way. We're not gonna miss this for the world. When we're devoted to something like that, we don't wanna delay or anything to get in the way we're persistently, obstinately devoted to it. What is that? Well, the new believers were devoted to word-centered ministry. It says here, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They ate it up. They couldn't, they couldn't get enough. That's why they stayed around. They wanted to learn more about Jesus, and it wasn't boring. It was captivating. So I can imagine what it must have been like to sit under the teaching of one of the apostles. Don't, don't you really wonder what that must have been like? Well, we do have an account. It's the account uh, from one of the earliest church fathers. Uh, and I read this actually at a class uh, last week. Irenaeus wrote a letter to his friend who was being tempted maybe to backslide a little bit. Well, Irenaeus and his friend, let me read it to you. Um, and they're writing about Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. So anyway, let's, let's go with this. Such things, he said, the elders of an earlier generation, those taught by the apostles themselves, transmitted to you. When I was still a boy, I saw you in Lower Asia in Polycarp's company when you were cutting a fine figure at the imperial court and you wanted to be in favor with him. I have a clear recollection of the events at that time uh, then of recent happenings. Uh, what we learn in childhood, it develops along with our mind and becomes a part of us so that I can describe the place where Blessed Polycarp sat and talked, his goings out and comings in, the character of his life, his personal appearance, his addresses to crowded congregations. I remember how he spoke of his conversations with John and with the others who had seen the Lord, how he repeated their words from memory, and how the things that he had heard them say about the Lord, his miracles, and his teaching, things that he had heard direct from the eyewitnesses of the Lord were proclaimed by Polycarp in complete harmony with Scripture. To these things I listened eagerly at that time by the mercy of God shown to me, not committing them to writing, but learning them by heart. I, by God's grace, I constantly and conscientiously meditate on them. Isn't that just captivate you? It just captivates me, my imagination. Today, the apostles aren't physically here. You know, I can't hear their voice like what they did. But we have something just as firm as if we heard it from their mouths. On the evening of his betrayal, 
Jesus promised his disciples. He said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Then he goes on in John 16, 13. You can read that. Well, the spirit came at Pentecost. And we can be sure that those apostles shared as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, Peter says this, he says, we have a, a prophetic word strongly confirmed and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, he says, you know this, no prophecy of scripture comes by the prophet's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter is saying, we didn't make this up. I mean, we were there. We didn't, in fact, he says, uh, later he says, we did not offer to you cleverly devised fables. We're telling you what we saw. John wrote, he says, that which we have seen and that which our hands have handled of the word of life. They were eyewitnesses, and they testified. John says it's true. I can remember when I was saved, can't you? How I couldn't wait for, for Wednesday nights when I'd meet with other students in this crowded dorm room, and we'd open the scriptures together. It was after, as the Lord was speaking right to me, and he still does. Life-changing words. That inner compulsion, that devotion, that hunger, you know, for God's word. Um, Peter says it this way. It says, like newborn babes, a desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's, it's been a while since Jenny and I had babies in our home. But last time I checked, babies do not whimper for milk. <laughs> they obstinately, persistently cry out for it. <laughs> and that's what God did with these devout Jews. That's the kind of heart they had for the apostles' teaching. Today at Highlands, we're devoted to the word of God. Wherever the word is preached, wherever the word is taught, the goal of our teaching is not head knowledge. Uh -uh. The goal of our teaching is life change. Because that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying in, in the great commandment, in the great commission, he says this. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them what? Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Notice Jesus didn't say here teaching to feel good or teaching to satisfy our curiosity. No, Jesus says teaching to observe everything. That's what disciples do, isn't it? Disciples wanna emulate their master. They wanna be like them. So when we wanna be like Jesus, we, he is teaching us to be like him, to observe what he's teaching. That's what we do here. We teach for life change. And how do we do that? Well. 2 Timothy 2 um, uh, says this, 2 Timothy 3 says this, all scripture is inspired. It has that quality of being God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished for every good work. The word of God's profitable, it says. In four areas, it's profitable for teaching, it's profitable for showing us where the path is, right? It's profitable for uh, rebuking. It shows us when we've gotten off the path. It, it's profitable for correcting. It shows us how to get back on the path and it, for training in righteousness. It shows us how to stay on the path. The word of God is sufficient for everything that we need for life and godliness. And next we see... These disciples were devoted to gospel-shaped community. The Spirit of God did something in Acts that was never done before. 
He gave birth to the church of Jesus Christ. And people from all over the known world were there to experience that birth. People from every race, tribe, every, every color, every language were now united in this new thing called the church. The Greek word here is, is koinonia. Actually, Luke only uses that word once, and it's here. We, we see this word used a lot by Paul in his letters, but it just means sharing. It means intimacy. It means fellowship. Um, in other words, these believers did life together. They met daily in the temple. They also met from house to house. And, and throughout the book of Acts, we see this, this kind of, uh, this dual nature of fellowship, daily from house to house and, and corporately uh, in the temple. They shared meals together. They observed the Lord's Supper together, actually um, a partaking of the bread here. It's believed that it's actually one and the same. Um, they did both. They worshiped together. And since these Jews were from all over the empire, they stayed around, didn't they, a length of time to receive the teaching from the apostles. They needed additional room and board. Uh, so we see the Holy Spirit imparting to these new believers a sense of, of generosity, this uh, hospitality. They shared their possessions when there was need. And yet we do that today, don't we? At Highlands, in our benevolence fund, we shared with our church family, those in need. Uh, they shared their possessions with out-of-towners, and they continued, and this continues to mark if you read the accounts of Christians throughout the centuries, the spirit of generosity. Tertullian, who was an uh, early Christian author, reported this. He said, this is what the Romans would, um, would observe about Christians. He says, the Romans would say, see how they love one another. They couldn't figure it out. Justin Martyr, um, I had a great time looking at church fathers, so you, you just kind of know that. But Justin Martyr, another first century Christian said this, we used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring to what we have into a common fund and we share with those in need. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. Sound familiar? Now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. Clement of Alexandria, again, one of the first believers at the turn of the century said this. He impoverishes, this is with Christians, he impoverishes himself out of love so that he is certain he may never overlook a brother in need, especially if he knows he can bear poverty better than his brother. He likewise considers the pain of another as his own pain. And if he suffers any hardship because of having given out of his own poverty, he does not complain. <laughs> Perhaps you're here for the first time or second. Well, welcome. <laughs> you have a place here. And it's not just a place in a chair in this auditorium. You have a place in a church family that is waiting to welcome you. I remember when Jenny and I first attended here, we didn't know anybody. It was awkward, it was uncomfortable. And uh, you know what it's like being in a strange place with people you don't know. But soon we found people who cared. We joined a community group and connected with brothers and sisters that became our lifelong friends. That invitation is open to you today. Do you want to connect with people in that way? Do you want to develop lifelong friends? Do you want to share life together? And well, I would, I would encourage you, join a community group or host one. You might feel that your place isn't big enough or maybe the furniture isn't, there's not enough furniture or your, your house is too messy or whatever but the invitation still should be open. True hospitality isn't about impressing people, is it? True hospitality always comes before pride. One of the, 
One of the ladies told me once, he says, I didn't have time to clean my house when my group showed up. So she said, I welcomed the women with warmth. I invited them into my messy rooms and refused to embarrass them with apologies. I let go of my pride. And then one of the women said to me, I used to think you were perfect, but now I think we can be friends. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, uh, that the messiest people are the most hospitable, okay? You get, you get the picture. But notice the early church met regularly. It says they met daily, and they persistently, obsti obstinately persisted, they were devoted to meet. Now, we have to take into account this is a special circumstance, okay? Out-of-town guests needed to stick around to hear the apostles' new teaching, but uh, our culture might not have the margin, really, in our lives to, uh, to accommodate that. But really, the, the, the idea is the same. They met regularly. They met often. They didn't forsake the, the assembling of themselves together. Why? Why meet regularly anyway? Well, Hebrews 3 it gives us one reason. It says this, but encourage one another daily while it is called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What is there about sin anyway that makes it deceitful? It's when sin no longer appears like it's sin anymore. That's the deceitful part of it. And what the scripture says is that it can happen in just one day. Today, more than ever, that's true, isn't it? Make room in your life for fellowship. Find a brother or sister to encourage you. Um, connect with them regularly and often. You know, three years ago, I connected with a brother in Christ, actually a neighbor, and um, he, would, he had just lost his son in a car accident. And in the wake of grieving, we began to text each other every day, we began to text each other scripture verses, you know, on uh, background slides. You know what I'm talking about. I can't tell you how many times I was encouraged by those texts. And it lifted my spirit at just the right time and protected me from the enemy of my soul. And I trust that, you know, he experienced the same. Well, notice too that these disciples... They were devoted to persistent prayer. Being devout Jews, now they already had a pattern of prayer in their life, a habit, you might say, but there was something completely different now. They had intimacy with God that they had never had before. Now they could call God the same thing that Jesus did, their Abba, their Father, their Daddy. Romans 8 says this, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, no. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Imagine 3,000 Jews from every nation entering into the throne room of God by the blood of Jesus, now crying out to their daddy, united with him, by the Spirit of God for the first time. I mean, how glorious that would have been. I wonder if God couldn't stop the tears from coming of joy of seeing his people come to him. That's exactly what heaven's like. You know, we read in Revelation this, the same thing happens. After this, I looked, it says there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language Nitch could not number standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands, praising the Lord. Now they could have the confidence of coming into the very presence of God without a priest because of what the death of Jesus had done for them. It had cleansed them from every sin, past, present, and future, that separated them from God. And every day they met in the temple, it says, they must have seen that 60-foot-high curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, 
from the people. They must have seen that curtain ripped because of the, what death of Jesus had done. I don't think the priest had time to sew it back up yet. <laughs> that curtain remains open today, figuratively, actually, for each one here. And you could come right into the presence of God himself. You can just step right into his gates with thanksgiving. You can step into his courts with praise. Hebrews 4 says, let us therefore approach his throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can truly have, as John Chrysostom said in the fourth century, conversation with God. I remember, maybe you did too, the first time you prayed aloud with friends, it was the most powerful, one of the most powerful times of my life when I knew I was talking to God directly. You know, at Highlands, we want you to experience the joy and the power of prayer. We give you resources to help you in your personal devotions. You can join a community group where you can pray for each other. You know, my community group, we've been praying and seeing wonderful answers, miraculous answers, really, to prayer. You can be a part of a prayer team which meets weekly, and we pray over the requests on your Connect cards. You can join in our prayer gatherings about once a month here at Highlands on Sunday evenings. That brings us to our fourth observation today. These Jews, they had a missionary heart. They were one of the first witnesses of the gospel of Christ. You know, we read every day, the Lord here it says, added to their number every day, those who are being saved. Who did the saving, it says? The Lord did it. And how often did he do it? He did it every day. You know, the main character in the book of Acts, it's not John or Peter or even the apostle Paul. It's the Holy Spirit. We see throughout the book of Acts this phrase, Day by day, the Lord added to them. Day by day. You read in Acts 5. You read in Acts 16. And all throughout the book, it ties this whole, um, it's the theme of the book. But, uh, you know, when it comes to saving people, what we learn too is that since the Lord added to their number day by day, the Lord doesn't take a day off. I'm not saying we don't need time, a rhythmic time in our lives to rest. We do. But when it comes to saving people, he doesn't take a day off, and neither should we. The Lord healed on the Sabbath. He made people whole on the Sabbath. He probably even took the Shabbat elevator. I don't know. <laughs> the same is true, though, for the Holy Spirit. The day, the hour, the moment that we want to sit back and just kind of chill might be the day, the hour, or the moment that a friend, loved one, or neighbor, the Holy Spirit is drawing them to the Lord. But, you know, today we kind of, this is our culture, we kind of section, section life off, okay? We have a compartment for, let's call it work, job, right? We have a compartment for family. We have a compartment for, for hobbies, Okay? We have a compartment for Super Bowl. <laughs> we have a compartment for church. We have a compartment for friends. We have a compartment for, for Facebook. And we think to ourselves, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit God in this compartment. And over here, I think I'll just minimize them maybe a little bit in this compartment. But with the Holy Spirit, there are no compartments. He fills heaven and earth. He is working every day, everywhere, full on. The earth can't contain him. It's not a matter of thinking, I'm going to sideline him over here, and yet I'm going to put him on the active roster over here. We are not the coach of the Holy Spirit, okay? We are on his team 24-7 to do his will, on earth as it is in heaven, he is God. And our work is to get in step with him, wherever that may lead, whenever. 
You know, I can't imagine the impact on Jerusalem. (laughs) Gospel-shaped community, word-centered ministry, persistent prayer, a missionary heart. By the way, those sound familiar to you. (laughs) They should. They are the core values of Highlands Community Church. Isn't that amazing? The same Holy Spirit that was working in the church to do these things is the same Holy Spirit that is working at Highlands to do these very things. Imagine these devout Jews, though, living in freedom and forgiveness, praying for and loving their enemies who were, and people who are different you know, from them. Imagine how their lives have changed when they discovered that salvation and forgiveness are a free gift. They didn't work for it. They don't have to earn it. And when they realize that the salvation is free, it's, it's not earned, it would pull all of the self-righteousness, all of the pride, all of the attitudes of superiority out of their lives. Can you imagine the effect that must have had on their families? And seeing the love that they shared among other believers, the unity, the generosity, no wonder they had favor with all the people. What a witness. Well, here we read that signs and wonders were performed. It doesn't say what was performed. It doesn't say uh, exactly what they had looked like. But we do know that the Jews at that time, it says they require a sign. They told the Jesus early on in his ministry, the uh, Pharisees came up to Jesus and they says, what sign can you give us that, this is, that your work is from God? In John chapter two. And so we know that the Jews require a sign. Um, what's the purpose of a sign? Well, it's to point the way, right? To point direction. Maybe to warn people or to inform them in some way. In the gospel and in Acts, miracles were performed as signs to point the way to Jesus, to authenticate the gospel and identify Jesus as the Messiah according to Old Testament prophecies. Because God's miracles are never meant for entertainment, were they? At his trial, at Jesus' trial before Herod, Herod said that, oh, I wanted to see Jesus anyway, he said, because he wanted to see some miracle from Jesus. He had heard that Jesus did miracles. And so Jesus was put before Herod. Did he do any miracles before Herod? Uh-uh. <laughs> we, um, we see that he didn't. The Son of God does not come as a Disneyland attraction in this earth. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And while we may not see God interrupt the laws of nature in the same way that he did when he was on earth, he is no less active and able to do so today. I don't have time to share the stories of miracles that have happened in the lives of people, even here in our church family. As an example, Celebrate recovery. Every single week, there's miracles that happen as people are released from hurts and hangups that they've had to deal with for years because of the power of Jesus, and there's no other reason. If you were to go and to hear those stories, you'd go, that's not, there's nothing human that could cause this kind of freedom. Miracles are happening here, and God can change lives, and he can change your life as well. Do you want to be used of the Holy Spirit as a sign to lead somebody to Christ? Christians are under observation 24-7, aren't we? Really? Uh, One of my, uh, actually one of my tennis buddies uh, told me that he didn't know if he believed in Jesus until he saw his wife, who is a believer, respond to her diagnosis of cancer with strength and patience and faith. And he said how she responded in the days of treatment and chemotherapy and radiation and surgery and more treatment and chemotherapy and radiation. 
he confided to me there's something real there in her life that he could not deny. See, your life is a sign, fellow believer. You pray for your enemies. When you seek to make peace with others, reach out in forgiveness with no strings attached. When you're generous and you put others ahead of yourself at your own peril, people are watching. They take notice. They see a Christ-like life. And that's the spirit-empowered gospel at work. So let's summarize our time, okay? In this way, let's use this illustration. When a person repents and believes in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into their life and provides the driving force in their life. Um, From there, the Spirit then begins to work in a number of ways to transmit his his energy to the rim. First is the the word-centered ministry. He creates a hunger and devotion to God's word. He opens a brand new way of intimacy as we talk in prayer to our Father. He connects us with his church in intimate fellowship. And he empowers us as his witness as we partner with him day by day. What does that result in? Those things result in a Christ-like life. That's what people see. That's where the rubber meets the road. They may not see, if if that wheel is turning in a balanced way, you're not gonna see the spokes. They're not, maybe don't see what's causing all of this, but what they see is Jesus at the center and they see a Christ-like life. God's spirit is all about creating that in us at Highlands Community Church. How is our wheel today? What are the people seeing in us? Are they seeing an attitude of praise and joy and sincerity? Are they filled with this sense of awe as they see our devotion to God and our love for one another? Are there maybe some spokes missing or some spokes shorter than others, kind of in an unbalanced way? What would that be? And then I'd ask you individually then, How does your wheel look? What are some things that you can call attention to maybe to have that balanced Christian life? Now, I've got to warn you, these spokes are not laws, okay? We don't work and earn anything by practicing these. If we did, if we thought we did, we'd go right back to to using the Shabbat elevator. I don't want to go there. No, we're talking about a spirit-led church here. We're talking about something that was born 70 years ago and exists today with the same heart that the early church had. Saying, you know, we can't do this alone. We need the Spirit's help. Let's depend upon him. Invite brothers and sisters to encourage you and experience the freedom and the joy that comes from times of refreshing. Let's pray. Father, maybe there's somebody here that is living in disappointment and heartache. Maybe they feel they just can't measure up. No matter what they do, they feel trapped. And that sense of powerlessness comes over them and the fears and the failures. And Father, we pray that your spirit would break through right now. That you would show them the love of Jesus. Show them that you paid for every sin, past, present, and future, every thought, action, word, deed, that you paid for everything in the cross, that you would give them the freedom that these devout Jews had. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for new life in you. We pray as we live for you, We would live lives of blessing that people would see. We ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen. Would you please stand? Thank you.